and we're going to be working tonight using, again, the, the clay cones. They come in three different sizes. This one I'm going to be working on tonight is the medium. There's a smaller, there's like a 7 inch, a 12 inch, 21 inch is the big, and then we've got the new oval cone. I haven't used the oval cone yet to do the gnome trees, but I think that would be kind of cool. It would give you a, a little bit wider tree. Um, we are going to be coming out with a larger size of that cone and probably a smaller size as well. So um, when we work on the cones, um, they are ceramic bisque. And I talked last week about why I like the cones. When I started out doing this, I was using, I found a styrofoam cone at a craft store. And what I found is when I was pressing the clay onto it is a lot of times that styrofoam cone dented in. And then I had a hard time removing the piece from the cone after. And as many different things between gnomes and witches and snowmen and trees and all the different things <clears throat> that we do, wizards, we do with the cones, um, I knew that the styrofoam ones weren't going to last very long. I tried cardboard ones and paper mache and those two, they had a lot of flex to them. And so we designed these molds. The reason this foot is on here is so that when you do your clay work on here, you go down to that foot. That foot should not be getting covered with clay. Um, that's for, for a couple reasons, for stability of the cone. And it also, when I, I did a workshop, and some of you have heard this story probably many times, but I did a workshop one time when we were doing witches and we were draping liquid slip covered fabric on the piece. And about halfway through the workshop, people asked, when do we take the cone off? And I said, you know, that was one of the first steps after you got your clay on there, you should have removed the cone. And it was really difficult at that point to remove it because there was so much wet fabric on there. Um, and so this foot, when I'm doing workshops, I can keep an eye. If I see that foot st sticking out on somebody's piece, I know that they haven't taken the cone off. And that was one of the main reasons that we, we added that foot. So all of the cones have that, that foot on there. They're ceramic bisque, they're earthenware bisque, so they're, they're durable. Um, but I still wrap these with newspaper. And um, the reason I do that is it makes the clay slide off a whole lot easier. And it also, um, that paper then can be tucked inside of the piece once you take it off the cone and it adds a little bit of stability. So just wrap the, the cone, I stick the extra paper on the inside, I'm not worried about it being over the foot, and then if I need to I'll add a piece of tape just on that, that paper to kind of secure that paper on there. You can do two layers of paper, it doesn't matter, at least one layer of paper on there just makes the piece come off a whole lot easier. Um, the clay that I'm working with tonight, I'm going to be working with a, a Raku clay body, and the reason I like this Raku clay body is it has sand in it, and it also helps add stability to the piece, where if I use a real smooth clay, a smooth clay, once I start adding all these different things on it, it adds a lot of weight, and sometimes those pieces get a little bit heavy, and if you don't do the clay thick enough on there, the pieces want to start to tilt and, and um, collapse on you. So if you're working with a, a mid-range clay, if you're working with a high fire clay, any of those clays will work for, um, for this technique. I'm using a clay slicer. If you don't have one of these, these are great because you can adjust this purple bar to whatever thickness you want your slab of clay to be. And so um, you can roll out slabs with a slab roller if you want, or I just cut off pieces that are about a, a half an inch, between a quarter and a half an inch thick. Um, a lot of times when people are transporting their pieces, I will tell them to do it a little bit thicker just so that the pieces are a little bit stronger and not quite as fragile. And it also makes it <clears throat> so that once you start adding all those pieces on, the, the piece has more stability as well. I'm going to flip the, the camera down here now so you guys can see what I'm doing. So I've got the cone here, and what I'm doing is I'm just taking those slabs of clay and I'm kind of wrapping those around this piece. Now, if I did a slab roller or used a rolling pin, I could roll out a slab of clay, and that would be great. Um, but not everybody has a slab roller, and sometimes in workshops, if we don't have enough rolling pins, it can be a little bit of a challenge. So I just wrap the clay around, and I go down as far as I want on the cone. I don't have to go all the way down on the, um, the cone. I can just go down part way if I want. So um, on this one, I'm going to go down pretty much to the bottom, 
and I'm not real worried at this point about this piece being perfectly smooth. My goal at this point is to get the cone covered with the clay and I can break off pieces and fill in little areas and then I'm going to take a flexible metal rib and I'm going to run that over the top of this piece to kind of smooth that clay and compress all of those joints where those pieces of clay meet. And I like these steel ribs because they, they are flexible and I can just take those and I can run those up the cone and down the cone and really mash that clay together and eliminate those joints where the pieces of clay meet. And um, it also, if I drag it across, I can take off any um, extra clay that's there. So I can kind of drag that off and fill in any low areas. So I'm going to do that over the top of the cone. I want to make sure that the top of the cone is also covered. And I'm not looking for a perfectly smooth piece at this point because we're going to add lots of stuff to this cone and you're really not going to see much of this cone, but it gives us a base to attach all of our other parts to. And now I'm going across and I'm dragging this down and I'm taking clay off of areas where there's bumps and extra clay. <clears throat> Bottom of the piece I'm not too worried about yet, but once I get this smoothed out, I'm just going to pinch the top nice. I'm going to take a wooden tool and I'm going to just use that to cut the bottom of this. So I'll usually go around, add a line, and then I'll go and actually press into it and kind of cut away the clay on the bottom so that I have a fairly even bottom all the way around. And I'll just pull that clay away and I'll save that and use that on some of the additions on this piece. Got a question? Yeah, do you smooth the inside at any point? No, I don't. Nobody really sees the inside of it. I mean, if you wanted, you could pull this off of a cone and, and smooth it. Um, sometimes after the piece is dry, I will go on the inside and if there's any kind of sharp points, I might go in there and kind of um, just take a, a damp sponge in there and smooth out some of those areas if, if needed. So, Donna, oh. Donna I, I got your comment. I don't know why sometimes they disappear, but I, I just did that one. So, just because you're using a raccoon clay does not mean you're going to raccoon the piece, right? No, it, it's a raccoon clay is a, a clay body. This can go up to, I think, cone two or three. Um, I generally do a low fire on this piece. Um, and go to like an 04 for my greenware firing and I can do glazes and things on here. Now if I was doing a um, utility utilitarian piece, I probably wouldn't um, use raccoon clay because on some glazes you'll get some crazing and things that's not compatible with all glazes and so you can get some crazing and so if it was going to be a piece that I was going to use for a, a cup or a bowl or a plate or something, um, I wouldn't be using this raccoon clay body because I, I definitely get some crazing in the glazes, but on decorative pieces like this, it's fine. And I could be using a mid-range clay body and doing my, my glazing and things on this with a mid-range glaze as well. And I just happen to have a lot of raccoon clay here. Um, and so it is one of the clay bodies that I work with a lot. I'm just going to get the second cone prepared because we're actually going to show you guys how to do three different gnomes tonight. We're going to do um, the, the bark textured um, tree gnome. We're going to do kind of the traditional tree gnome. And then we're going to do the one that I kind of call the frosted gnome. And he's got, kind of looks like he's got like fondant or frosting on him. Um, and they're all very similar techniques with just a few um, differences that, that are done on each of them. Does the newspaper pull off easily when it's dry or do you fire it with the piece? So the, the newspaper, when um, after I take the piece off of the cone, um, I'll generally leave that paper in there. And then when I go 
to pick the piece up to load it in the kiln. A lot of times I'll just take on the inside and I'll twist the paper on the inside. And I'll actually, these are short enough pieces that tonight um, before we're done, I will try to remember to show you guys how I twist the paper out. Now you can also leave the paper in there and you can fire it and that paper will burn away in firing. But if you don't have a vent on your kiln or if your kiln, if the room isn't vented well, um, you will get smoke because that paper will burn inside the kiln and um, you can you can have some smoke. So we are done with the entry for the mystery box. All right, mystery box is yep, it's 13 minutes in and we are cutting off the entries for the mystery box at this point. Just gonna get this last cone wrapped here. I had hoped to do this before we got started tonight with the last like 15 minutes before I realized I never pulled anything for a mystery box and so I was kind of running around grabbing stuff to put into the mystery box tonight until we get these cones wrapped ahead of time. So it'll just take me a minute to, to finish up this cone and you'll be surprised how quickly this technique goes of building these guys on here. I'm a little disappointed. I thought you were doing the holly tree. No, the holly tree. So last week I did the clay share live, and um, that was so clay share. Their general um, clay share event happens um, earlier in the day here in Wisconsin. It's at four o'clock in the afternoon. They um, the people who run that are are on the east coast. And so they um, do it at five o'clock uh, Eastern time, which is four o'clock Central time, which is three o'clock Mountain and two o'clock Pacific time. So it's early for a lot of people, but that is recorded and that recording is, is on my page. And so during that live last week, um, we did the leafy gnome and we did the leafy trees and the holly tree is done the exact same way as the leafy tree that I show in the live and I, I, I show the holly tree and um, talk a little bit about that and, and kind of how it was finished um, during that. So that recording is on my page and you can click on that at any time and you can watch that recording as well. The cones are so versatile. There's so many different things that you can do with the cones. Um, and I'm always coming up with other other ideas and things that can be done. All right, I'm going to cut the bottom of this one off and then we will get going on the different techniques with these gnomes. And you can also, you don't have to do these as um, tree gnomes. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you tonight also works for doing really any of the gnomes. This one here is, let me turn the camera off for this one. This is, this is my version of Harry Potter. Um, but this is just one of the traditional gnomes that's not done as a tree. So I didn't put any type of branches or anything on him. So, um, and I do have a recording back from November where we did just the regular gnomes as well. And we'll probably be coming up with some other techniques for that as well in the near future that we'll be showing. So let me flip this back down here. All right, so we've got our, our cones made. Now, we're going to start out with the... Um, bark texture gnome. I should have shown this when I had the camera back up. So this one back here, this has the bark texture. We're going to do that one. We're going to do this one here that's kind of the traditional tree. And this one can be lit up. The bark texture one, I've just got some little lights wrapped around that one. And then we're going to do this one which is the one that I call kind of the frosting gnome or the, the kind of fondant gnome. And this one was also made to light up. <clears throat> if you haven't seen the holly tree, this was the holly tree that we showed. This is on the new oval cone shape. And this was doing the, the leaves with the new holly leaf forms and the new cone. And the little berries on there are little red lights that, that light up. I was shocked at how many people ordered red lights in this last week and they're actually, we, we ran out, we sold out of them. I never anticipated the hundreds and hundreds of um, sets of lights that we were going to sell, but more are on their way right now. We should have them um, by the beginning of next week. All right, let me flip this back down here. All right, so. Oh, someone oh. was wondering if they could make 
their own cone? You can. I mean, you can make a cone with um, with clay. Some people will throw it on a wheel. If you're good at throwing on a wheel, um, you could wrap it around something um, and create your own. It's it's done with with slip. We make molds for them. Um, the the oval cone. That one just started in production last week, and um, we've gotten a lot of those out, and a lot of those are shipping already this week as well. So now what I'm doing is I'm just tearing off chunks of clay. So a lot of those scraps of clay that I had from trimming off the bottoms, I'm just breaking these into pieces. And this is my bark texture pad, and this is a ceramic pad that has a really deep uh, bark texture. So I'm just taking these pieces and I'm going to take and press them against this texture pad and pick up, oops, get it under the camera here, the bark texture. And these are going to be my branches. So I'll tear off lots of pieces and I'll just randomly press these. And I'm not real particular about the shape or the size of these. You'll see all different um, shapes and sizes. So you don't have to sit here and roll balls of clay or cut them into perfect squares. Everyone is going to be a little bit different. Um, someone is commenting that they're loving your outfit. Yes. I feel you're usually <clears throat> stressed a little more, you know. Yeah. Somebody, so I had volleyball tonight, and I raced home from volleyball to um, do this, and usually I would put something else on, and so you're seeing me in my volleyball gear. <laughs> so I'm going to make a whole bunch of these, and I'm not going to do this entire gnome. So I'm just going to do enough of these to be able to do the one side. Sometimes if you get the clay a little too thin on there, it doesn't want to release. So I'm going to press these two pieces together so I get a little bit thicker and these pieces will come off. And go on to different areas of the texture pad or do any type of texture that you want. You know, you can use um, stamps, you can use fabrics, you can do any type of texture. I like this bark texture. Um, I've done plain trees just all in this texture, not done them as the, the leafy gnomes or the, the bark texture gnomes. Um, you can do the whole tree, and, and I've done those in Raku, and I'll maybe post pictures later of those done in Raku to show you guys what those look like. All right. Someone's asking which tree is first, but I don't <clears throat> I'm doing the bark texture tree okay. is, is the first okay. one that I'm doing. So that was the, the the brown one that was on the, the side with the light strung around him. And I'll, he's a, a heavy one, and I'll hold him up after I'm done showing you the technique on it so you can see what he looks like finished. So all of these bark pieces um, I'm going to press into this cone. Now, I don't want to go all the way to the bottom. And this is a big mistake that a lot of people make when they're doing trees and gnomes is they take their stuff all the way to the bottom. And the problem is when you go to pick this piece up later, it's really hard to handle. And if you take and you set it down and those, that texture or the leaves or whatever you're putting on here goes right to the edge on the bottom. And when I say to the edge, like this goes right to that bottom edge. So I want to go up a little bit off of the bottom. And to disguise this, um, I can put some type of texture in there. A lot of times I'll just take um, <clears throat> a scoring tool. I like this one, this Kemper tool. This one is, I, I kind of call it a hair tool. I like to use this one to add a texture just to the bottom of this cone. So I'll go around and just pull this texture up on the bottom of the piece. Another question? Well, someone just said not tree gnome, but it's a tree gnome. It's a tree gnome, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and did you win at volleyball? <laughs> We, we won two of the three, yeah. All right, so I've got that texture all the way just on the bottom edge where that bottom is going to show. I could do any type of texture that I wanted in there. Then I'm going to take these pieces that I made with the bark, and I'm going to start positioning them up off of the bottom, and I'm just going to set this one there and squish it in, and I'll start to work my way around, overlapping these slightly, and I want to really squish this clay into the top of the cone. And then I'm going to start doing kind of like brickwork. So I would go all the way around. I'm just going to do part way on this cone. And then the next one is going to overlap and it's going to kind of come in the middle. So instead of 
stacking a row of these straight up the cone. I want to kind of like I'm laying brickwork and put this in there and have it in kind of the middle. And I try to do that as much as I can. And again, continue to squish these in to the tree. Now, a lot of you are probably like, well, why aren't you scoring and slipping these pieces? And that's kind of the nice thing about using the cone is I don't have to score and slip because um, I'm really squishing this clay in. And so what I look for in workshops is that I don't see the top edge of those pieces. If, if I see somebody that puts a piece on and it looks like this, and this isn't squished in like you see next to it, really squished into the piece, I will tell them you need to squish that more and drag your finger up and squish that into the, the piece. I'm just going to go a little bit further on here so that when I put the beard and hair on, we've got enough, enough of an area. I'm going to add one more piece over here. Now, how high up do you go on the cone? Because this is the shorter cone, um, I'm just going up two rows of bark, and then we're going to build his face, and we're going to do his hat. Um, but we want to kind of decide where is the top of his hat going to be, or where's the top of his face going to be. And so I know that I want to do that um, rim of the hat up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a coil where the rim of his hat is going to be. And so this coil should be about the diameter of my thumb is usually what I say in a workshop. And I will add that coil and have it go all the way around. Now this coil wasn't long enough to go all the way around. So I'm doing another little piece that I'm going to piece in here. It's not imperative that this is a perfect coil. Um, and then I'm going to squish this with my finger up into the cone, leaving the rounded edge on there. Now, um, I showed last week <clears throat> doing this on the leafy gnome. And um, you don't have to do anything on the underside of this. We want that to stick out because that's going to be kind of the, the rim of his hat, and we're going to add texture to that in a little bit. So now I've got this area to work with for his face. I'm going to take a ball of clay and roll his nose. And, oh, another question. What cone do you fire it with? Um, you're going to fire it according to the clay body that you're working with. So my greenware firing, most people will do an 04 firing for their greenware firing. And then your glaze firing, if you're glazing it, is going to depend on what type of clay body you're working with. Now I'm going to, because this one, I can't squish this in and mash it into the piece. I'm going to score the back side of it and I'm going to use my handy dandy little retractable scoring tool and I'm going to score the back side of that nose and I'm going to determine where that nose is going to go on the cone and I'm going to score where that is going to attach on the cone and then I've got slip that's mixed up here that I'm going to take and I'm going to dab and slip is just liquid clay that you can make with the clay body that you're working with or if it happens to be a, a low fire clay body that you know what percentage it shrinks. You want to make sure that the slip that you use is compatible with the clay body that you're working with. When I put that nose on, I don't just stick it on there and leave it. You probably saw that I kind of wiggle it like this. And the reason I wiggle it is I want those score marks to kind of mush together. And, and we joked last week that in workshops, I go up and I grab people's noses and I tug on them to make sure that they're attached well. If I come up to somebody in a workshop and I grab it and it pops off really easily, I explained to him, I'm like, you need to kind of wiggle it back and forth to lock that together. Now, once I've got the rim of the hat on, I've got the nose on, now we can start adding the hair to um, our guy. And I'm going to work with um, a hand extruder. Um, you can sit and roll all the little coils of clay, but you're going to see how much easier it is to do this technique. Um, using a clay extruder. There are different clay extruders. I've got this one, which is uh, made by Kemper. And then we've got this other one that's a little bit shorter. That is made by, um, used to be Shimpo, which is Nidic Shimpo. Get my hands out of the way so you can see the difference. So the main difference is the length of the extruder. Um, what I like about this big gold one is when I'm doing workshops, 
I don't have to reload this as frequently. Um, some people have a harder time squeezing the trigger because they're forcing that much more clay through. So I'm going to show you some tricks tonight to how to make it easier to use that extruder. Um, the other thing that I'll just remind you of is if you have a hard time squeezing the clay through because there's more clay in there, you don't have to fill this barrel up all the way. You can fill it up to the same length as this extruder. I get a lot of people when we ran out of the needed um, extruders, people were panicking and they're like, well, I need the shorter one because I might have a harder time squeezing that bigger one. It's really the, the trigger mechanism is very, very similar, um, but the amount of clay that you put in there, and then I'm going to show you ways to use it where we put it on the table and you get better leverage and things. But So let's get this loaded. So to load the extruder, both of them have a trigger on the end, and you need to press that in and pull back on this. And what that does is it pulls the plunger back on the inside. So your extruder is pretty much always going to stay attached on this end. You're going to load the clay from this end. And this end will come off. And I don't clean my extruder out because I have one for, for white clays and I have one for red clays. If I'm switching clay bodies, I will wash it out. But I used um, Raku clay in this one last week. And I just tap and knock out any dry clay that is in there from the time before. So I'm going to take a chunk of clay and I'm going to make a tube of clay that will fit down inside this extruder. Which extruder is easier if you don't have a lot of hand strength? They both are pretty much, and I'll show you in a minute, how to use them. The trigger is really the same. It's the amount of clay that you're forcing through. So um, the, the smaller extruder is probably easier. But I'm going to show you, before you go on and start ordering extruders, I'm going to show you how to use this one. Um, and you can use for both of them if you have a hard time squeezing the trigger. You can um, use it on the, the table, and it will make it a whole lot easier for you. When I do workshops and I'm extruding a lot of clay, my arms get very tired very fast, and um, someone was actually just asking if you let them do it themselves in your classes, or if you do it for them. Well, I initially start out doing it for them, <laughs> um, and depending how big the class is, um, I'll usually have multiple extruders sitting out in the class, and I'll usually um, extrude a bunch of clay for each person. I'll walk around and extrude a bunch out so everybody can get started. Because you end up with people that um, it takes them a little while to get used to it. And then everybody's sitting waiting for coils. So I'll usually go around, I'll squeeze some out, and then I'll set the extruders down. And I'll be like, okay, you guys are on your own now. If I see somebody really struggling with it, I will go back and um, help them with it. Now, the die that we're using, the Kemper extruder, this one, the gold one, comes with... Um, four different dies. It comes with a large circle, which is, I've got it out here somewhere in my pile of stuff here. I'll pull the, the extruder out and show you the different ones that come with that. Because that's the other difference is which dies come with the extruder. So the gold one comes with a small hole a medium, and a large. And we're going to use the large on one of these trees. And then it also comes with a three-hole die that does three coils at a time. And that comes with this one. The Nidic Shimpo extruder comes with some dies that I've never used. Um, but this one has a blank die. So you can use like a power drill or a hacksaw to cut your own designs. It has the large circle. It has a triangle. Haven't used the triangle a whole lot. It has the spaghetti one, which is what we're going to use to do the beard on our gnomes. It has a square. I have used that one quite a bit. And then it has what I call kind of a rectangle or a ribbon die, and I've used that one quite a bit. So the triangle is the one that I, I don't use a whole lot. And so the most popular one in the Shimpo dies is the spaghetti one um, that is kind of unique to that one. So um, 
and they don't sell them separately. They sell that whole set of dies. So if you buy the Kemper one, you would have to buy all of those dies, or we sell now just the, the 12 hole die, or yeah, 12 hole die individually. So if you get this Kemper extruder, you can buy this, this die by itself. The difference is this one is plastic and they're really durable. Um, and the ones that come with the Shimpo one are, are metal. So I'm gonna use the plastic one tonight. This clay, um, I also chose because it does have sand in it. It's a Raku clay. And so when you get a clay that has grog or sand in it, it is a little bit more challenging to get through the extruder where a smoother clay does tend to work a little bit easier because you don't have that sand in there that's kind of resisting. So most people will hold the extruder this way and they will squeeze the trigger like it's a gun and that makes sense and that works for a lot of people. If you have a hard time wrapping your hand around this and getting your hand all the way around there, if your hand isn't real big or you don't have the strength or you have arthritis, um, sometimes turning it upside down because then you can kind of grab it like this and you can really pull on that handle this way using your hand. Um, if you still struggle with it, take that extruder and put that plunger on the table and then put your hand on here and you can actually, I can stand up and I can really get good leverage to get that clay to come out of the end of that extruder. And so using it on a table like this, and what I do on the top as those coils come out is I use my other hand to kind of wrap around the top. So as they come straight out, the coils hit my hand and they don't get caught on the edge of the metal of that extruder. And so I can extrude out bunches of hair and I will just break them off, kind of pinch them together on the one end and leave them loose on the other end. And I'll just continue to squeeze out bunches of those coils. So if you have a really stiff clay, and that is sometimes people will get clay and it's really thick and stiff, and you're gonna have a harder time getting that through an extruder. You want to soften that clay by putting either damp rags in the bag of clay, or um, there are different techniques for softening that clay, um, like poking holes in the bag and putting it in a bucket of water overnight. Um, because sometimes you never know how long clay has been sitting in a, in a warehouse. Um, I don't order more clay than I'm going to use in a few month period because I don't want that clay just getting getting hard in there. But sometimes you order it and you don't know what you're going to be getting. Oh, about how long are those coils? So the coils, it depends on um, how big of a cone you're doing. If I'm doing a taller cone where his beard is going to be longer, I'm going to do longer coils. These are probably ranging from about three inches to about six inches as I extrude these out. So I've got a whole bunch of them extruded out here. Whoops, in my extruder, I just hit the mouse on my thing and it blocked my screen. Um, Are you going to talk about the thickness and how long it takes to dry later? Or yeah, I'll talk about drying and firing and all of that. We'll get to that throughout the live. So I've got my bark on, I've got my texture on the bottom, I've got my nose, I've got the rim on my hat, still working on the cone. And um, I'm going to take and I'm going to score this whole area where his hair is going to be because we're going to add slip and we're going to add hair. So I will do a little section at a time with slip and I will dab some on here. Oh, someone asked what happened. Are, are, what did you bump? Something? Is that what you said? I don't know what's happening. Someone just said what happened, but it was a couple minutes. It was like a minute. Or two. No, I had just bumped the mouse here and it just popped up like I right clicked it and it just oh. popped up a, a screen on there. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what she's talking So about. now where the, the coils are kind of pinched together on the top, I take and I kind of tuck those under his hat and then I kind of bunch up the coils as they come down and press it against. I don't want little individual coils sticking out like this because those are just asking to get broken off. So I usually kind of pat this down and make sure that those coils are attached well. And I will continue to bunch those up 
and add and tap and then I'll add a little bit more slip and I will take a bunch of the coils always tucking that kind of pinched together end in and then you know I may have a couple coils that hang down really low I can just break those off I don't have to leave all of those coils on that piece add some more slip tuck the hair press it down and just continue working my way all around on my gnome now your hair can come down straight if you want some people will do a very straight beard coming down on their piece I like to kind of bunch it up so that it's not coming down perfectly straight so it's layered from your bark on the bottom to now your beard and you would continue going around and make the hair and back as long as you want so the bark would go all the way around then your beard is going to go on top of that and then on the top of the hat we're going to go and I'm just going to get all these coils out of here because we'll use these on the next gnome on the hat now I'm going to go and I'm going to start adding more of those bark pieces leaving the rim of the hat sticking out and I'm going to add a layer of the bark and I'm going to continue working my way up to the top of the cone and we're going to pull the gnome off when we get up right to the top of this I could probably pull it off at this point but I still like that strength and stability of the cone behind it as I do this and again I'm going to lay it like brickwork coming up so I'm going to have some that are in the middle again squishing these in and when I get to the point that I have room for like one or two more layers of bark on the top that's when I'm going to pull it off of the cone so my bark would have gone all the way around on here um, and then I will just take and gently lay him in my hand put my other hand inside the cone I'll pull out the extra paper put my hand inside kind of wedged like this and I'll just kind of twist the cone like this back and forth and slide that out the extra paper I can just take and tuck inside if I'm doing a real tall 21 inch gnome tree I will take other newspaper and bunch it up inside have that bunched up and ready so that I can tuck it inside like I said these 12 inch ones these will be stable enough that I can actually pull the paper out if I want I don't have to leave it in there so what I do is I grab it and I start twisting it and I just keep twisting and eventually it pulls the paper away from the sides of the cone and I can pull that paper out of the inside of the cone there might be a little bit up in the top of the cone and that's fine um, because that will burn away in firing that little bit of paper up in the top then I want to kind of stand up and I want to set my gnome down and kind of wiggle him to make sure that he's standing straight up and down for the hair it looks like you barely pressed it on <clears throat> there issues, issues with that staying on? that's why I've got the slip underneath it so I oh. scored it and slipped it and then I pushed the hair on and so as I pushed it down I kind of wiggled it and that hair kind of works its way into it's the um, it yeah it kind of works it into um, the the score marks that we've got on there so now the top of this we can add and I'm going to put him on a board um, I always set them on either a piece of drywall or one of these wood project boards or a bat from my wheel um, so that I can easily move them around so I'm going to make a few more pieces of the textured bark pieces of clay to finish off the top on here and then on, on the top of this because I'm getting to the point that I can't mash it into anything when I get to the very tippy top so I'm just going to hold these pieces here I can probably do one more layer that gets squished in and then the very top pieces I'm going to slip and attach I need to make a couple more 
some dark texture pieces here. All right, so when I get to the very top here, I'm going to score. I'm going to score the back of these pieces because I'm not going to be able to mash them in. So I'm going to score. I'm going to add slip. And then I'm going to position these and just wrap them around and not squish it real tight that I lose the texture in my bark. If I did squish it too much that I lost texture in there, I could take my bark pad and I could press it against there to add the texture back into that piece. But I try not to pinch because I've scored, I've added slip, and I've got my top pieces of bark. Um, the texture on the rim of his hat, I usually will use just a, a wooden tool that's kind of pointed, and I will go along and I will just poke little indentations, and I'll lift this up closer to the camera for you to see. I'll just poke a texture into the rim of his hat, and I'll show you guys the finished sample more close up too once we're done with this. You can see how that looks. Have you ever fired your gnome in your raccoon kiln like you did with your beautiful pumpkins behind you? Yeah, so my raccoon kiln, that most of I have um, electric raccoon kilns, and I also have a gas raccoon kiln. And um, so the I fire my greenware, I fire my glazes and everything in that electric kiln. It is a, a regular kiln that um, that you can do traditional firing in. And then I also do raccoon firing, which next week, Wednesday, I'm going to be doing with clay share. I'm going to do um, a live with them showing a brand new technique that I'm I'm not sharing with anybody yet. And um, then we're going to be raccoon firing the pieces as well. Once I add that texture in there, then I can go along and I can take and kind of lift and kind of fluff my bark pieces so they stick out a little bit. I don't usually do that until after I have it off the cone because a lot of times when you pull it off the cone, it kind of flattens those pieces. So you can fluff that out. Don't fluff it too much. Um, you don't want pieces getting broken off really, really easily. What average price point did you say they go for? So these gnomes, I've had, I had somebody last week that sold gnomes this size, 12 inch gnomes. Um, she sold them for like 200 bucks a piece. And she had, and she had done like um, overglazes, mother of pearl. I mean, her pieces were absolutely beautiful. The effort that she put into um, creating those pieces was, was just amazing. But, you know, on a 12-inch gnome, I can't imagine selling it for less than $75. I probably would go 100 or more on the 12-inch sizes on these big ones like this. And i got to unplug this one so I can hold them closer to the camera here. Um, oops, I've got that wrapped around the other cord here. All right. And this guy, oops, this guy has traveled around a lot and, and has had some pieces get broken off. Um, but that, you can see the rim of the hat. You can see the bark going all the way up on there. You can see the bark down below his beard and where a couple pieces have, have gotten busted off as I travel around with him. Mm -hmm. And this piece, ironically, the back of this, i got to show you guys the back. If you've ever fired stuff too soon, and we're going to talk about firing, um, and there's moisture in the piece, this is what can happen. <laughs> you can blow parts of the piece off. So this piece had some moisture in the backside, and I tried to fire it too soon. This I did a few years ago, um, and I blew the back off of this piece. But I did him as a, a sample, and nobody from the front ever realized that um, anything had happened to him. All right. I'm going to show you hands on, on this guy, kind of how I do the hands. And um, I usually start out with a piece of clay, and I turn it kind of into a coil.
but I leave the one end as a little bit bigger and I kind of pinch this end out to be the length that I want his arm and hand to be. Part of this is going to get stuck inside of the gnome, so do it a little bit longer, about a half inch longer than what you really want it to be. And then this end of it, I flatten out like a paddle. And then I will kind of round it on the edges, so it's kind of rounded and flattened. And then I will take a needle tool and I will cut my fingers. One, two, three, four, five. I've got my thumb, I've got my fingers, and then I just kind of go and I pinch. And you know, these are gnomes, so the fingers don't need to be perfect and smooth. And so I will kind of work these and pinch them. Sometimes I'll use that wooden tool to get between the fingers to kind of smooth this out. And then I'll go along and decide, okay, I've got my thumb, doesn't need to be that long, so I'll pinch part of that off. My pointer finger can be a little bit shorter. That middle finger can be the longest. Ring finger can be a little shorter. And the pinky can be shorter, and then I'll kind of round those off. And you can make these fingers, you can get as, as detailed as you want. Um, I generally don't get real detailed. I've had people put fingernails on them. I've had gnomes that look like they've gone for, for manicures. Um, I'll take my thumb and kind of smooth out a little bit of the roughness on there. And remember, as, you, as these pieces dry, you can always go with a wet brush after it's dry and smooth this out. The clay isn't um, done until you fire it. So I've got my, my arm. I'm going to bend this back down so you guys can see it. I'm going to grab my gnome back here. Um, do you have a video on how to glaze your gnomes? It was tedious. <laughs> no, I don't have a video on how to glaze the gnomes, but I'll kind of share a little bit with you guys when we get to the end of some finishing techniques. Wherever I want to put the arm, I'm going to use that wooden tool that comes in the basic pottery set. And I'm going to go on the side of him and I'm going to determine where I want that arm to be. And I kind of poke this in and it's almost like it's a drill. And I poke a hole into the side. And then I'll take my arm and the dogs are deciding to wrestle now. I'm going to take the arm, I'm going to dip it into slip. And I'm going to take and I'm going to put that inside. And that's why I said make it about a half an inch longer than it needs to be. And then I will kind of pinch the clay around that arm and bend that arm around to how I need it to be and work the fingers. So his, term, his arm is attached on the side. And you can make them as long as you want. You can have them sticking out. If the arm is sticking way out, you may need to support it with sponges or bunched up paper or things under it until that dries. And so you do two arms you know, on both sides. And all of these gnomes have the arms. So I'm not going to show you on every gnome, but do an arm on each side, position it how you want. If you want to make little things to go in the hands, you can do that, make it with clay. Or on my gnome, I ended up doing um, some little glass ornaments or plastic ornaments on um, the gnome to be holding. So the next one that I'm going to show you guys is the tree gnome. This one starts out the same with the clay on the cone. We prepped all of that. And the sections of the tree, all of the rings on the tree, are all done with coils. Um, so I'm going to load the other extruder. And I've got the large hole die inside of that one. I'm going to put clay, drop it down in. And again, I could roll out these coils by hand, but having an extruder is kind of like if you don't have a slab roller and you're used to rolling slabs by hand and then you get a slab roller, you think, oh my gosh, why didn't I get a slab roller a long time ago? Extruder is kind of the same way. So I'm going to extrude a bunch of, um, or a long coil. And 
And again, my clay is still on the cone. And you can see, you know, I'm squeezing this trigger and I like to work with the extruder upside down rather than right side up. I tend to get better leverage this way. And it looks like a big turd. <laughs> yeah, isn't that nice? Um, I'm gonna grab one of the other cones here and we're going to, I'm actually going to grab the turntable for this too so it can spin a little bit easier. And this coil, I'm just going to position, and the coil is going to kind of go up and down. Instead of just straight around that piece, the coil is going to go kind of up and down and meet up. I'm going to pinch it off. Oh boy, kind of Mike is reading all these comments later. He's going to get a big head. Uh -oh. All the nice things they're saying. <laughs> So this is kind of like the rim of the hat. As I put each of these coils on, I'm just going to go and I'm going to squish and mash this into the cone. Again, I want to keep in mind how big do I want his face to be on this piece. So I don't want to go up too high with coils depending on the size. So I'm going to do now the next row. Sometimes these coils will touch the ones below. And so a lot of times I will go up and down and those branches might touch. They might go away. And I kind of pinch that down. So again, I'm not just putting a straight coil around. I don't want this to be like coil, 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 coil. They're going to go up and down on that piece. And I'm going to again squish them into the cone. Yeah, we have a lot of deer in our backyard, and so the dogs go outside and they get very excited. I don't know what they would ever do if they <laughs> caught one of those deer. <clears throat> and they're usually be, be on the other side of the fence line. So, um, all right, so then once I've got some coils on the bottom, again, depending on the height of your tree, is going to determine how many rows you do. So I'm going to do a couple of them on the bottom. Keep in mind how tall I want the face to be and where I want the rim of his hat. Now the rim of the hat is going to go pretty much straight around. Sometimes I'll have it go a little bit lower on the back side, um, but that's pretty much going to go straight around. And again, I'm going to squish that into the piece as well. Did you say you use raccoon clay because it's a little more durable and has the like the... Yeah, it's, it's more for stability that I like the raccoon clay. Um, it's not that it's necessarily more durable when it's done, but yeah, more um, stable because it has some sand in it, that it's, it's not as soft as a smooth clay body. Now on the top, I'm going to add some more coils going around for the branches. And again, I'm going to squish those in. And I'm just, I'm going to roll a little coil by hand here because I had almost enough I think, yeah, my extruder is empty, so I'm just going to roll a coil by hand here to finish off the top. About how thick do you think this is at this point when you're building it? So the, the cone itself was about um, a half an inch thick on there, and then we're adding, you know, these coils on here that probably stick out another half an inch. So there are areas of this piece that are an inch thick at this point. Now I'm going to roll the clay for his nose. I'm going to score it just like we did on the other gnome. I'm going to determine where that nose is going to go. I'm going to score. I'm going to add slip to that nose. I'm going to stick that on there. And again, I'm going to give it kind of a wiggle so that it locks in place. And then um, I want to add texture to this piece. And so the texture can be done using things like this scoring tool or this hair tool. And I'm going to start at the bottom and I'm going to pull the texture down from the underside. And then I'm going to work my way up to the next layer and I'm going to do the same thing, pulling it down from the underside to the edge of the branch. 
I will score and then I will go up to the next one and I will add the texture. And so I'll just continue to do that all the way around, starting at the bottom and working my way up to the top. There are going to be lots of little chunks of clay on here. It's really hard to get those off when the when the clay is wet. Leave those on there. After it dries, you can rub your hand over it like this, and all those little chunks just flake and fall off. I'm going to do the same thing on the top. I'm going to add the texture. And I usually leave the very top of the tree because when I lift this off of the cone, I will add that texture onto the top of the piece. I'll just go around a little bit further here. I would, of course, go all the way around on this piece, but I'm just showing making this on one side. And I can't see, because I'm looking at this upside down, but up in here, you guys can see there's kind of some smooth area. I would normally be working on it this way, looking at it where I could see if I was getting up into the top. All right, so we've got that. And then we're going to score all of the areas where we're going to put the beard. Again, take and apply slip. And then we're going to take our bunches of coils and we are going to Again, kind of tuck them under and kind of bunch them up as we bring them down. Don't make these coils too far in advance. Um, you don't want them getting real dry and stiff. So make them, you know, kind of right before you're going to use them. And again, I could go straight with these, but I like to to bunch them up to get a little bit fluffier looking beard. All right, again, I would continue with that hair all the way around on the piece. And then at this point, he's ready to take off of the cone. I do the same thing, lay him in my hand, pull the excess paper out, stick my hand inside, wiggle the cone, and pull that out. I can either. Sometimes I do. Um, I've got a flight tomorrow morning. I have to leave the house at 5 a.m. So I get to the airport to catch a 6.55 a.m. flight out tomorrow. So chances are I'm not going to be sitting down here tonight finishing these. I'll probably throw plastic over them and try to finish them when I get home uh, over the weekend. Um, so then I would go after I've got it off the cone because I've used that top area to pick this up. I would go and add my texture to the very top. I always like working on a, a banding wheel because I can just spin that piece around as I add that texture. Um, if you want that textured rim on the hat, you can go back and use that wood tool to poke in there on that edge. Um, you can add arms like I showed on the other one. If you want to add holes to add lights into your piece, um, you can use different things to, to poke the holes in. I really like to work with the um, hole punches, and there's different hole punches out there depending on how big of lights you're going to go with. There are hole punches that are completely enclosed and have um, kind of a tapered tip that poke in, and then there are tools that are semi-circle, that they're not completely enclosed. Um, I use both of these because there are different sizes that come in each set. But this one here, the, the second size in the, there's one more tool that I don't have out here, a size in between these two. Um, I like the smaller one because in the very top of the tree, if I want to put a star in this tree, I can put a plastic star. And I can take that tool and I can poke it into the top 
And then because this is a semicircle cutter, all I have to do is twist it in a circle and it will pull out that clay from inside the top of this tree. And I can just take and, and pull that off of the tool. The ones that are completely enclosed, they tend to fill up with clay, but I will use those to do my holes in the tree, or I can use that, that semicircle one, and I can just go around and anywhere that I want to have a light, I can poke that in, twist it, pull the clay off, poke it in, twist it. And you just want to make sure that you're going all the way through the clay and that's where pulling that paper out initially makes it a little easier. You just have to remember if you don't pull the paper out, as you're poking into it, this tool is also going through that paper. If you um, want to use the ones that are the full enclosed, you can take those and you just poke those into the clay and pull them out. Sometimes you'll get the little piece of clay gets stuck on the end. It'll get wedged inside. I don't worry about pulling that out. I just keep going and poking those holes in the piece and and sometimes those those pieces will get stuck inside or get one here they kind of get stuck in there and and when i go i'm not going to pull that out i can go right into my next hole and the clay will either build up on there or the piece will kind of get wedged inside and you just need to pop it loose before you fire it so there's the different the, the different hole punches that you can use to add your holes on your piece you can add arms to him and he is done Yeah, B-Mix is, I believe, I haven't worked with B-Mix in a long, long time. I believe that has um, some sand, possibly some grog. Grog is um, busted up fire brick, and so grog is grittier than sand. The sand, I think, is usually like a silica-type sand, a fine sand that's in the clay bodies like this Raku clay body. Um, so yeah, the, the B-Mix will work, but again, how fresh is that clay? If it's a really, if it's really hard, I had somebody a while ago told me they actually broke this plastic die extruding clay through it. And I asked, I said, how soft was that clay? Well, it was really, really firm. I've only had one person that has actually broken these because these were designed with extra support. There's an extra ring on here. They're made to be thick and durable um, where the metal ones are thinner, but they're they're metal, and this is a, a durable plastic, so um, you should be able to use the B mix with them. But again, if it's real stiff and firm, you might have a harder time squeezing that trigger, and that's where put it on the table so you can get good leverage on that plunger and push that down on the piece. What green is on the tree gnome? That those these gnomes were all done with acrylics. Um, I didn't do glazes on the tree gnomes, so they were all done with acrylics and dry brushed. So there was like on the, the tree gnome, it was a dark green and then dry brushed with a couple lighter greens. Um, then the snow was put on that piece. And I'll talk about the finishes when we um, get, to, we're almost to the end of this. This last one that I'm gonna show you guys is almost a repeat of everything that I've showed you with the exception of how I get this texture on the piece. So I'm not going to show you much of this gnome other than adding this texture. And while I've been talking, I've been rolling little balls of clay. And so to do this one, we're going to smooth the very bottom of this. And I'm just going to use my, my finger to do that. Um, I could take a sponge and I could smooth that. Just be careful if you do use water that you don't get too much um, on there. So these balls of clay, this is really easy to do. Um, I'm again, not gonna go all the way to the bottom. I'm gonna leave a little bit of an area there for me to grab this, but I'm gonna push that ball of clay on and then I'm gonna take my finger and I'm gonna indent it and I'm gonna squish it. And I'm going to do this all the way around. And I wanna make sure that up here, just like the bark, I wanna make sure that these are squished in really well and mashed in. So I don't need to score and I don't need to use slip. I can just take and squish these on. And then I'm gonna do another layer. So I would make my way all the way around the bottom of the tree. And then again, like brickwork, I'm gonna lay this next one kind of in the middle 
and I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to squish it in and work my way around and layer these up. Now this one I did as a gnome tree, but you can do the same technique doing an entire tree this way as well. I also have this owl here to show you. This was doing a vase, an owl vase, and that same texture that I'm doing right now, starting at the bottom, working my way up, is the texture on that owl vase. So I'm just going to work my way up. Again, going up as high as I want for the face. So on this tree, I might do a couple layers, and then I'm going to put the rim for my hat. And I'll hold this guy up here. Like I said, I don't need to show you everything on this because a lot of this we've already done on the other ones. So I'll do my layers on the bottom here that I want. I'll put the rim of where my rim of my hat is going to be. And then I will add his beard, like we just did on the last gnome, on the tree gnome, or his nose, his beard. And then I'll continue with those balls of clay, working my way up to the top of the tree. Now this tree, you can see, I kind of bent it a little. So after I took it off of the cone, I kind of gently bent the top of this a little bit to get this top so that it kind of got a little bit of a curve so it wasn't just straight up on there. And then this one, I added a little ceramic bowl to have some of the plastic lights inside that bowl. I use the hole punch to punch holes in for the lights all around on this guy. Now, if I want to light these up, I could put a hole in the back and put a pinch light in there. Or what I plan to do oh, is... Someone asked about that. Are you doing light kits or are you using votive candles? Yeah, and, and so I caution you on using real candles in there because these lights and these stars are plastic. And so, yeah, a battery powered votive candle, or um, you can get um, pinch lights. And I should have brought one of them out here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create just doing a ball of clay. And it's almost going to be like doing a pinch pot. And I'm going to stick my thumb inside. And I'm going to open this up and actually go all the way through and open this up and turn this into a ring. In the pinch lights, you know, the pinch lights are back in the workroom. They're on the workbench, like sitting in the blue brush drying tray right at the end. Just grab one of those pinch lights and then I can show them how that will work inside here. So I'm basically making a ring and then I'm going to take and, and set that down on my board here and kind of flatten the bottom. And then I will take the large cutter and I'm going to cut a notch in here where the cord will go out and then on the back of the gnome after I would take him off of the cone I would poke and cut out a notch for the cord to go under the back side and Janine will bring one of the um, pinch lights here and I'll show you then how that pinch light will go underneath and inside here and it will hold the bulb upright and this will sit underneath the cone and hold that light upright in there. Because if you just put a big hole in the back side of this, that light bulb, if you go real low to the bottom, that light bulb will re be really close to whatever table or surface you're setting your piece on. And so um, this will hold the bulb upright and it should give you better light reflection in there. There we go. So this is a, a pinch light. And I can add these to the website if you guys are, are interested in these. I do have these in stock. We didn't put these on the website, but this will go up inside here. And this little part pinches and springs out. And so once this is fired, that is going to hold it. My cord will come out of that notch, and then that will hold this upright inside of the piece. And then the weight of that piece sitting on the, the cord is gonna keep that from, from tipping over inside there. So that's that's kind of my plan. And that was my plan with the holly tree as well was to put under, oh shoot, I didn't glue these red lights in. And I just tipped this upside down to show you guys the inside. And there are red lights everywhere. My slip has red lights in it now, um, but that would go underneath this tree. And I would have a notch in there where the cord would come out up there as well. So now we're all decorated for Christmas all over my work surface here. Um, we do have the 
the medium lights based on the response to the lights last week of the little red pin lights that i just decorated my surface with we do have these multicolor lights on the website we do have the stars on there as well and these the stars don't glue into the piece just stick those into the hole um, because these are like a weapon when you're packing them and unpacking them take this out and put it in a, a ziploc bag with your piece so that you don't poke yourself because the tips of these are are pretty sharp and and they can catch on things as you're you're working with them do you add anything on the bottom of your piece after it's been fired to keep it from scratching the cable yeah i do have on the bottom of these pieces i get these little rubber and you can get cork or you can get little rubber ones um, that, that peel off and stick on um, to the bottom of the piece so that they don't scratch now once these pieces you know are done and you've got them drying i usually let the pieces dry naturally for a couple of days i know there was a lot of discussion last week after the live about putting them in plastic do you wrap them in plastic do you not wrap them in plastic generally you would wrap these in plastic like i'm going to do it because i'm not going to finish these tonight so in between while i'm working on it i'm going to put a plastic bag over it so it doesn't dry out if you have a, an area where this is going to be sitting while it dries and there's air vents and there's a lot of airflow through the room you might want to loosely put plastic over it because things like the arm are going to dry faster than an area that's all full of, of hair and beard you know little parts of the beard might dry a little bit faster and so a lot of clay bodies will shrink as they dry and then if you have areas that are drying faster than other areas you can get cracking um, i generally the area that i have my pieces sitting um, there aren't heat vents or air conditioning vents blowing down on them so I can set them out on the counter I put them on a surface that will absorb moisture so those project boards that I was working on drywall anything that will absorb moisture if you set them on a laminated countertop or a plastic tabletop or something that won't absorb moisture that moisture is going to get trapped between that surface and the piece so um, I, I set them out on a project board I set them in an area where there's not a lot of air circulation. I leave them sit for two, three days. And then if I've got a kiln that I'm going to be firing, I will take those clay pieces and I will set them on top of the kiln and let them heat up from the beginning of firing to past the end of the firing. When the kiln cools down, I'll pull them off the top of the kiln. But I will go and I will touch the top of the pieces as once the kiln is done firing. And I'll see if I touch the top of that piece and it's really hot, there's a really good chance that all of that moisture has has made its way out of the piece. Um, if it's not hot and it still feels kind of cool and damp, I know that there's still probably some moisture in there and I either need to leave it on the kiln for another firing or I will put these pieces back in the kiln or I'll put them in the kiln and do a soaking. So a lot of digital kilns, you can program them to do a soak at the beginning of your greenware firing and you can put it in there it heats up to about 180 degrees and then it'll hold for however many hours you tell it if i've got a, a really full load of a lot of heavy pieces sometimes i'll do a 12-hour hold on there heating to 180 degrees it costs very little for the electricity it sounds like a long hold time but once that kiln gets up to 180 every once in a while you will hear it click in and turn the elements back on so it's not like it's sending power to the elements for 12 hours it's a minute here and there that it's it's just sending a little bit of power in there um so there's so, really no hard and fast t amount of time right Someone asked before how long does it take to dry but yeah i it generally generally i let it dry naturally for a few days then i put it on top of the kiln let it heat up and and try to get all that moisture out if i'm still worried that the piece might have some moisture put it in the kiln and do a soak on it for as long as you think it it will take um, the worst thing to do is to rush it and blow the piece up like I did on the backside of that. No, unfortunately, it was on the backside that it blew up and nobody had to know about that. And I, I did do a video a while back when I really tried to push it with the load and um, I, I blew up a whole kill load of stuff and it, it was just a really stupid thing that I did. So, oops, I have an ornament stuck to my shirt. All right, so finishing these guys, after you get them fired, if you're going to do acrylics, um, this beard can be a challenge to get color down in there. So if you're doing acrylics, thin down. I did like an acrylic gray. I thinned it down and I kind of dabbed the color so that it ran in between all of those crevices. So thin down to a wash consistency, put that in there. The tree, very textured. I thinned down a dark green, 
dry brush white on the beard, dry brush flesh on the nose, dry brush light greens on the tree, put some no fired snow on, did white dry brushed on the, the rim of the hat. Um, really pretty simple to finish. If you're gonna do it in fired finishes, kind of the same concept with the beard. If you want a gray beard, do like a wash of a product like Stroke and Coat or Concepts, thin it down, dab it in there. It's gonna run down on the piece, but then you'll do the same with your green glaze, getting it on the tree. On the beard, you can just wipe it back. If you're working with a white clay, it'll be white. If you need it to be more white, if you're working with an off-white clay or a buff, you can go back and you can brush some a product like White Stroke and Coat on there to brighten it up to more of a white white. There's fired snow, there's no fired snow. This one is no fired snow on this piece. Um, the candy or the frosted tree, this one was done in a teal acrylic and dry brushed with a lighter color. Um, there's some white on the edges. There's also some of the pearlescent white that I took with a fan brush and I kind of brushed it up on the edges to get that real white pearlescent finish on the tips. Beard was done the same way, hands, you know, pretty, pretty simple actually to finish with acrylics or with glazes because there's not a ton of color, um, different colors on here. On the Bark Gnome, he was done all in black. Whoops, I set this other gnome on top of his cord. Almost brought him with on this one. All black, dry brushed with browns on the bark, a little bit of white on the bark, gray on the beard, white on the beard, flesh on the, the hands and the nose um, to finish him. If I was going to do this in glazes, I would probably find a, a glaze that would, um, like an element glaze that I could use on the bark that would give me kind of multi-tones, or I would do a wash with black stroke and coat and then kind of highlight it with some browns and things on there as well. So either way you do it, it's pretty simple um, to to finish. Any other questions? Um, oh, so if you're if you're using your acrylics, it's only getting to fire to bisque. So yeah, it's just yeah. getting fired to bisque. If you're going to do glazes on it, you're going to do your greenware firing. Regardless of what clay body you're working with, you're probably going to do your greenware firing to an 04, even if you're working with a a mid-range clay body and then you know your glaze firing is going to be based on what products you're using and, and how hot they need to be fired for the products and the clay body so i can't use this raku clay body and high fire it because this clay body will only go to i think a cone two i think is two or four um, if i fire it to a cone five or cone six good chance that it's going to start to to warp or slump or even you know get kind of melted um, so make sure that you're firing according to the clay body that you are working with.